it's a place where you can go and be yourself, no matter how weird yourself is. So how did you get into this? Uh, I grew up in the circus. I So uh, my dad, when I was a kid, was working with Big Apple Circus. Um, and we left the circus when I was six and started doing renaissance fairs around the country. My dad eventually started his own show, did uh, school assembly programs, theater programs. So I had that taste of the life all through my childhood. And at the same time, my mother was a college professor. She's now retired in Florida. And so I still got a normal education on top of it. Looking back, was that kind of an interesting life? It's definitely an interesting life. Being the circus kid is really cool when you're six, and it stops being cool around 12, up until, I would say, like college. So like that whole stretch of like middle school, high school, not a fun time. We all have those teenage experiences, like I don't want to be my parents, but then how, do you, how did you find yourself back in it? So that's, that's a really easy question. I was actually, I was working for an ice cream shop and I was making six twenty five an hour. And my dad called me. He was like, I need you to, I need some help with this show. I will pay you. I think it was the equivalent of $50 an hour. And I was like, oh, 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 okay. All right. You can, you can make a living with this and much better than, you know, the minimum wage at the time. And so I was, I think I was 16 then, and I hadn't done anything with him for about five, six years. And suddenly I was like, oh, okay, well, let's, let's start relearning some of these skills, uh, learning skills that I never had in the first place. And then when I went off to college, it was like, all right, I can go back to scooping ice cream or I can just, you know, go out on the streets of Boston and just street perform and, and see if I can make some money that way. And it turned out that just by street performing in like September, October, and then again in April, May, when it was warm enough, I could make enough to kind of like have spending money throughout the year. I wouldn't say necessarily lucrative, but that's the first word that jumps into my mind. Like you can do this full time and be good. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So my dad has been a full time circus performer his entire, essentially his entire adult life. He worked um, when he was very, very young, kind of worked in a factory, drove cab just to kind of like pay the bills. But uh, since I would say about 30 years old, he has been a full time circus or Renaissance Fair performer. No side hustle, nothing, nothing like that. And he, he, let's put it this way. He's put multiple children through college, uh, with that. Um, it is, I think there's this image of, of circus people and Renfair people of, you know, they're, they're there because they don't have anywhere else to go. But if you have the right skills, um, it can be a very good career. Are there a lot of people that have those right skills? So like you can do this, but you got to be really good. I think where you get it the most is sort of in my line of work, where you're the variety act. You're not, let's say, a member of the cast at the Renaissance Fair. Um, you're not uh, working at a booth or something like that. So when you have a variety act, whether it's myself, someone like uh, Paolo Garbanzo, the juggler, um, you're in Arizona, so like Adam Winrich at the Arizona Renaissance Fair, those are people who can make a solid living in, and support themselves off of that. Now, when you do like kind of the variety show for people who aren't familiar, I know that you're n known mainly for the whipping, but what all kind of what what's the show? What do you do? All that kind of stuff. Well, so uh, just so I can backtrack, a variety show is is sort of anything that's not, let's say, doing Shakespeare. Um, so just variety circus tricks. Um, so my big thing that I do that you see on TikTok, Instagram, all that is the musical whipping. So I'll take two whips, use them to make a beat. And then uh, I will improvise lyrics as best I can on the fly with what the audience gives me. And that's what gets posted to social media because that's all improv. I, I kind of relate it to it's like a stand up comedian's crowd work. It's because it's different every show. I'm fine putting that up there. But then after that, I have, I would say, about 45 minutes uh, of completely, you know, scripted material that is a mix of stand-up and circus tricks. So whether it's target cutting with the whip, lighting a whip on fire, uh, fancy whip cracking, there's, there's a whole other set of the show that does not get posted because that's scripted material and you have to come see the show in person to see that. But why did you gravitate towards the whip? So when I was a kid, my dad did whip cracking and uh, Indiana Jones. So I think those two things. I basically, when I was a kid, it seemed cool. Um, and I had easy access to it. So, you know, the, the whip that I first learned on was one of my dad's old whips that was made by the guy who made the whips for the original Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones. Uh, so that was the whip that, I, that, that thing is worth like $2,000 today. And that was <laughs> the whip he handed to a seven-year-old to learn <laughs> 
how to use, which is not a good idea. I do not advise teaching seven-year-olds to crack whips. Yeah, that's kind of a more dangerous thing, right? Like, I don't know if you can do that today. Like, here, three-year-old, it's, here you it's go. It's not as dangerous as people think. It's it's dangerous, but it's um, as, if you're taking the right precautions, which is wear long long pants, sleeves, wear eye protection. That's the big thing. It's not too bad. I also say if you've got someone young, give them ear protection too, just because those things are loud. And I do have mild to moderate hearing loss, and you know you can avoid that if you just give your child some <laughs> some earplugs while they're cracking cracking their first whip, baby's first whip. You can. They're that loud, or you just done it so much that like. It's a combination of it. So um, most of the time, I actually try to not be too loud with the whips because it's it's louder for someone on the on the other end who's watching me because the whip, it, when it cracks, is, you know, six, seven, eight feet away from me. Um, and if I'm on a small stage, that means it's like two feet away from the audience. So it's right in their face when it cracks. Um, but there are a few cracks, a few whips that I have where it's just right next to my, my right ear and it is loud. So it's, it's, if you, I've taken hearing tests, the hearing in my right ear is so much worse than my left ear because I'm right-handed. Most of the cracking is on my right side. How do you crack it? I've never been like, I had a whip when I was a little kid, but I couldn't do anything with it. Like, how do you do it? So the first thing you do is don't try to do what everyone tries to do, which is they take the whip at like on the ground and they just kind of flick it up and down real right. quick. That's a really good way to hit yourself in the eye, hit yourself on the arm. Um, the trick is usually it's kind of like, and I've never fly fished, but I've been told that it's the exact same motion. It is the way that you would fly fish, which is you, you bring it back behind you, let it get fully extended and then bring it forward. It's kind of like, kind of like casting a fishing line, uh, not perfectly the same but it's 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 a process and then over time you just kind of develop the muscle memory i learned so long ago i have actually i have trouble teaching people now because i'm like just just do this that it's that simple just do this and they're like i don't know what i'm doing i have two children like explain to them how to run well, i don't know you yeah. just you just you just do it do it <laughs> and as a person who fly fishes like that's exactly how you fly fish right you let it go okay. all the way back and then you just kind of snap your wrist a little bit doing exactly it. um what do you think makes you good at it i think so what what i had the fortunate uh i, I had the good fortune of a couple of things one i grew up in the world so of, of circus so i've in i've kind of learned a lot just through osmosis um when i first started really really practicing whips I found that I knew how to do a lot of the tricks just by watching, having watched my dad do it so many times. Um, but then the other thing was, I've been doing this show 15, 16, 17 years now, so I'm in my mid-30s. I started performing solo when I was 18 um, in college. And so I had essentially 13, 14 years where no one knew who I was. I was, I was getting work, but not a ton of work. And so I had all that time to polish my show figure out how to do this, figure out, okay, what makes people laugh? What doesn't make people laugh and go from there. So I had a lot of time to fail off camera. And then, you know, this social media blow up didn't happen for me until October of 2021. By then, I think I was in my 13th, 14th season. So I had a lot of time to, to kind of figure it out. What was that like doing something for so long? And then all of a sudden, boom. It was it was weird. I mean, so the the initial videos that went viral actually were not my videos. They were videos of me that a fan took and put on TikTok. And, and suddenly these videos are going. My wife texted me while I was at work at my real job. At, I was working at a radio station and she goes, my friend just sent me this asking if this is you. Um, and so I was like, all right, well. I guess there's a demand for this after I think the second video went viral. So I was like, well, let's, let's make a TikTok account. We've got some old show footage. Let's just put it on the internet and see what happens. And it, 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 it was very quick within 10 days. It was like, oh, okay. All right. There's, there's a demand for this. Um, and then as it continued to roll, um, it was sort of like, okay, well, let's see if we can make this a career. Um, and it's, I, I think in a lot of ways, going back to being able to fail off camera, you know, the having the time that I did working both, you know, at, at Renaissance fairs and then also my work at working in radio, I got a chance, like sort of a taste of what it's like to be in the public eye without being a celebrity. 
And that kind of, I feel like I came into it not surprised, uh, not not surprised, but I, I, I sort of knew it's like, okay, this is what we do. This is how we manage expectations. This is how we manage, you know, making sure that I take time for myself, make sure I have things that are outside the public eye. Doing that was, was huge. Uh, and having that opportunity before this all happened was huge. Knew how to handle it. Like there was the, the groundwork was laid, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. And I've said, you know, had this happened when I was 22, I, I would not have been able to deal with it. I would not have been ready to deal with it. I would have turned insufferable. <laughs> yeah. I think you see that happen to a lot of people on social yeah. media, too. What was that like kind of being in the public eye, doing the radio stuff, and then like, hey, what do you do on the side? Like, well, I do this. I, I So I tried to not always publicly say it um uh, and and be super forthcoming about it I, it was not information that i would regularly volunteer um but certainly plenty of people that i i interacted with knew i remember it was very funny i was doing a show one time and i saw a boston city councilor who i had covered uh in in my crowd one day uh he was a terrible audience member he was talking to his wife or his girlfriend the whole time but um no i think i think early on there was this sense of I think people were kind of confused. They would give you this quizzical look. They're like, wait, what? What do you do on the side? Um, but I think after a few years, everyone kind of knew. And if they didn't know, they were just kind of like, all right. They, it, it, it's it's always, I. you either get this reaction of people are just shocked uh, or more more frequently, it's kind of just that people are like, oh, okay, that's cool. That's interesting. And then they move on. When did you start kind of in, including the singing in it? That came out of out of just an improvised bit. Um, I was working with another whip cracker, and I was just standing there. We both had one whip, and so I'm standing there, and I'm just going, ch 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 ch, and then he happened to crack just in time that we made the beat for "We Will Rock You." Ch ch, boom, ch ch, boom, and I'm like, "Whoa, wait, keep that going, keep that going," and suddenly we start singing "We Will Rock You," and I was like, "Wait a minute, you can probably do this with a bunch of stuff." So I tried to started trying out different beats. And I had taken a ton of improv classes when I was younger, when I thought, you know, maybe I want to be an actor or something like that. And making up lyrics to songs had always been something I was, I don't know about good at, but at least, you know, at that age, proficient at. Um, and I had done high school musicals, high school theater. Um, so my singing voice is not, you know, no one's going to confuse me for a professional singer, but I can carry a tune decently. Um, and so from there, it sort of became this idea of like, okay, well, let's, Let's try putting this in the show as what we call oh, <clears throat> the pre-show, which is the pre-show is not your good material. The pre-show is something that's good enough, that's loud to get people to come to the show. Because Renaissance fairs, you know, you have show times, but you don't have a set crowd. So you, the first five minutes, you're essentially trying to get more people to come and see your show. And so what I realized is musical whipping, being loud, singing songs, this is a great way to get people to stop by and watch the show. And so I made that kind of the permanent fixture of the first five minutes of my show. And that was probably starting around 2012, I would say, was when that happened. Are you surprised that it was like, wait, this? This is the thing? No, because I mean, I mean, you look at the popularity of people like Weird Al, um, and you know, there, there's a demand for it. It's not everyone's thing. Like I, I see my comments every now and then where people are like, "Really, people find this entertaining?" And I'm like, "Listen, I, I don't know, I don't get it." Yeah, right. Like, what, are you, what are you mad at me for? Whatever works, man. <laughs> How does that work? Then you get paid by the Renaissance Fair, or people have to it's pay a... to come into the show, or is it? It's a combination. So the f most fairs are a combination of they will pay you, and then you also get tips from the audience. And the tips are where you make most of your money, usually. Now, were you always, you can pronounce it better than I am, Z Whipper? Jacques Z Whipper, yeah. So early on, so we, my, my father and I essentially helped crea uh, create this, this act when I first moved to Renaissance Fairs when I was 20, I think. Um, and there are kind of three pillars of what makes a good renaissance fair show and you ideally should have a mix of all three um, but you can get by with two of the three if those two are really high and that's comedy skill and character and when i started my skills were yeah 
So we had to lean more on the comedy and especially on the character. And Renaissance fairs, most people are English, Irish, Scottish. You get the stray German every now and then. Um, very few French people. And so I was like, all right, well, let's, let's be French. Um, I took, I took five years, six years of French classes. I can, I can kind of fake it a little bit. Um, and it kind of worked. And then I remember the last day of, of my first weekend doing the character, I drew on the mustache and that seemed to make it click for everyone, which is that, oh, this is dumb. This is a, this is a, a skill show. This is you know a dangerous show, but this is still dumb. This is comedy, and we're here to have have a good laugh. And nowadays, I'm so glad I made that decision because uh, it allows people to understand that they should not be intimidated by by a man holding a whip. And that this is this is for laughs. This is to have a good time. What is it about Renaissance fairs? Because it's something that I haven't personally been to, but it's yeah. been my experience that people who are into it, they are into it. I think Renaissance Fair is, it's a place where you can go and be yourself, no matter how weird yourself is. So for a long time, it was a safe space for, uh, to, to, to put it bluntly, the freaks and the geeks of our world. And I, you know, I put myself in, in that category. But I think over the last, I would say 10 years between Game of Thrones, Witcher, the Lord of the Rings, um, being a nerd has become more acceptable. And of course, Marvel as well. Um, and so we've had this influx, I think, of young professionals, you know, people in their mid to late 20s. They're, they're finally making good money. They don't yet have kids. so They have a lot of disposable income and they have been coming to the Renaissance Fair in droves. Um, I noticed it around 2014, 2015, where I was like, hang on, everyone who's here at this show looks like me. It looks like they're at the exact same stage of life as I yeah, am. Yeah, I know what you Except mean. for like that family there and that old guy there. Um, so I think there's been a big jump in that clientele so that Renaissance fairs have grown. And then on top of that, um, in the years after COVID, it was an outdoor safe space. It was an outdoor space you could go and have fun uh, and not necessarily need to worry about being indoors with 500 other people to go see some kind of entertainment. So maybe I'm missing out. Do you think that continues, though? Is it a flash in the pan or like, no, no, I think we've set a benchmark. They've been around for 50 years, um, going back to the, the early one. I think it started in the 60s um, in California. And, you know, a lot of the festivals I work are in their, you know, they're 30 plus years old. They're 40 plus years old. Um, so I don't know that they're going anywhere in the immediate future. Um, I don't think you're going to see years like you did in 2021 was just an extraordinary year um, all around. Um, but I think, yeah, I think, I think they're here for, I think they're here for a good long while. Are you ready for some harder slash listener submitted questions? Go for it. Hardest type of whip to crack? Stock whips. Um, so there are essentially three kinds of whips. You have a leather bull whip, which is like an Indiana Jones whip. Um, you have performance hybrid whips, which are a combination of, a bull whip and a stock whip. And those are what you see me cracking in most of my videos. So I use, I call them my musical whips. And then stock whips, they come from Australia, uh, used for driving stock, driving cattle. Um, and they had this weird hinge on them where you go from the stiff handle into the braid of the whip. It's got this hinge on it and I cannot figure out how to work those. And it's probably just because I didn't grow up cracking those. I grew up cracking my dad's bull whips. So uh, I actually have a pair on their way to me now that I'm, gonna try and figure out and see if i can get better with them uh, but that's that's easily it um and that and the chain whip just because the chain whip is you know you're cracking a chain it's heavy it's floppy it is a really good chance you hit yourself and, and hurt yourself but that's that's I, I put that in a whole separate category that leads us into this question right like what's the worst injury that you've had like how often do you get hurt not very often. You know, I think people think whips are a lot more dangerous than they are. Um, whips will leave a welt. At the most, they'll leave, you know, kind of a, a, a shallow cut. And that's if you really, really mess up. Um, worst I ever did was in college. Uh, I, I was 20 or, I was 20 or 20, 21. And I went to go do a side crack. And as the whip came forward, it caught the back of my neck. And I thought it was just a welt. And then I learned the next day in class that I had not left a welt. I had left a long cut across the back of my neck. And someone in class leans over to me like, 
Jack, what did you do to your neck? And I just look at them and I gave the whip crack uh, motion. They're like, oh, okay, all right. We're not interested anymore. <laughs> <laughs> crack myself with a whip. I go. Oh, it happens. Okay. You know, we've all been there. All right. Um, what's your favorite song to perform? Um, so I, what I always like are songs that are a little bit slower or that have um, different rhyming schemes. So if it's just, you know, rhyme A, A, B, B, um, that's harder um, because your, your brain has to move faster. What I really like are songs that are slower and it's an A, B, A type of rhyme. So you have two lines before you have to come back and do the rhyme. So a good example of this is Sound of Silence. Sound of Silence is nice and slow. Everyone knows it. And you have tons of time to think up what the rhyme is going to be. So I have done Sound, sound of Silence a bajillion times. Um, it is never the same rhymes because every single time I'm adapting it to the situation because I have enough time to do it. Um, something like Eminem's Rap God, where he's making a rhyme every half second. Not my favorite to do. Those are a lot of th- those are a lot harder to do. How do you feel about Indiana Jones? I'm a fan of Indiana Jones. I was not a fan of Indiana Jones four. I thought Indiana Jones five was fine. Uh, I am very much, very much looking forward to the video game uh, that's coming out at some point this year. Who is your favorite fictional character with a whip? Besides, if it if it is Indiana Jones. I think right now it's Richter Belmont, uh, Trevor uh, from the Castlevania series, oh, uh, the Netflix yeah. series. Um, I so I watched both uh, both Castlevania series they have. I really like Trevor Belmont in the original of just being just a dumb himbo who's really good at fighting vampires, which I I enjoyed a lot. I thought they gave Richter a little bit more depth, um, and I like his costume a lot more. So I think right now it's uh, I, I, I'm leaning towards Richter at the moment. Can you really swing? From a tree or from anything on a whip? You can swing from a tree on a whip. It is not uh, advisable, and it is not something that you should rely on. So th- it's easy to tie the whip around the tree. It is much harder to get the whip untied around the tree. You know, I don't know that my whip would actually survive doing that more than two or three times. Is there an aspect of kind of like circus performance necessarily that... that- do whips seem to do better than something else to say that if you're juggling or throwing knives or anything like that, is there kind of a hierarchy of like, you want to make it, you get the whip. Well, so I think, um, I, I, my dad actually told me about this and talked to me about this when I was very, very young, where I was thinking, I was like, Oh, I should learn how to juggle. And my dad said, here's the thing. Everyone can juggle. Everyone in the circus can juggle. Everyone who goes to the circus has seen a person juggle before. Um, And so if you want to be a standout juggler, you really need to be extraordinary at it or you need to be so funny that you essentially don't need the juggling anyway. Um, And even then, even if you do all of that, there, you know, there are 10 other jugglers who are almost as good or just as good as you um, who could also do that, that act. Whereas, you know, I look at the Renaissance Fair circuit, there are three people who do a primarily whip based show. Uh, myself, Adam Winrich, Aaron Bach. So starting just from there, the the level of competition is much lower. And that was, you know, when he mentioned that to me, I was like, oh, okay, you're you're telling me that I can get more work for less less amount of practice? Yes, this sounds like a great idea. Um, so I gravitated to, towards whip cracking for that reason. Um, I also tried knife throwing. I have a knife throwing show that I don't do very often. Um, I have some other kind of miscellaneous circus skills, plate spinning, um, balancing, both, you know, whether it's on a tight surface or something, let's say, on, on my chin. Um, lots of other skills that I can kind of pull out, but they're not really, you know, the reaction that you get from spinning a plate is much less than what you get from cracking a whip. I have never understood the knife throwing aspect. Is it the knife? Is it the technique? Do you have to get the distance down? Like, how do you get it? All of the above. So um, what you want is you want knives that are weighted in such a way that they'll fly truer, um, heavier knives are better because there's less variation on how much they rotate. You want to spin the knife as little as possible. And then for me, so I know that 10, uh, nine and three quarters steps away from the knife board is where I want to be when I'm, when I'm throwing knives. The way that I throw them, the knife will rotate and it'll stick the same way every single time as long as I can find that distance. But if somebody gave you like a random distance, okay, I want you to do 13 and a half steps. Could you hit it or like, no, it has to be this distance? I couldn't 
consistently do that. I was amazed. I was sharing a stage <clears throat> with a guy named Cy the Sword Swallower in Colorado. And he does a knife throwing show. And I was watching him and I was like, Cy, I'm looking at the stage because normally you tape where your mark is, where you need to stand. You tape where the board needs to be and where you need to be. And I'm looking I'm like, Cy, where, where are your marks? How are, you, how are you figuring this out? And he goes, oh, and he walks up to the board, starts throwing knives and stepping back, you know, about a foot each time. And every single one of those knives stuck. And I was like, what? How do you, how do you do that? He goes, I don't know. I practice a lot. Jesus, man. That doesn't seem to really go along with like the laws of physics. I don't know if it's physics, but I would think like, no, you, it's not going to rotate again that fast. He just, he's, he's that good where he can, he can just eyeball the distance and change how much the, the knife is rotating. Okay. So we're looking at a video. Most bullwhip. Let me make sure the audio is off. Yeah, this is when I think I did 287 cracks. So this is actually not the current record because I broke this record in 2020. Um, but this is me swinging a whip back and forth 287 times, well, 290 times, but I missed a few cracks in it. Um, and this was, this was a record that I spent, most recently I spent about two years training, uh, six hours a day working, or six days a week working out, three days on, one day off, three days on, one day off. Uh, spent two years doing that, put on 15 pounds of muscle to do this record, and then promptly had shoulder surgery for unrelated reasons and lost all that muscle. I went from looking like Captain America to looking like my normal self, which was <laughs> sad. You need that much muscle to do that? Um, at the point that we had put it, um, you did. Um, because I, I had been going back and forth with Adam Winrich for a few a few years, and I wanted to just finally put it way out of reach. So I, I, in, in COVID, I decided, you know what? Screw it. I don't have anything else going on. I'm just going to work out as much as I can, put on as much as muscle as I can, and see you know, how high I can put this mark. I think that's the thing with like whips, though. It's one of those things where like you look at and like, I could do that. It, it's pro is it a lot harder than people think that it is? Um, I mean, cracking a whip in an, in and of itself is not difficult. Um, the record is difficult because I was one of those guys where I looked at the record. And I'm like, I can do that. And then I tried it and I was like, oh, oh, that's a lot harder than I realized. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think getting to where I am as a whip cracker, someone could probably do in six months to a year if they were dedicated. Um, and I've been cracking whips for, like I said, you know, 20, almost 30 years. Um, but then getting the record, it, it has to be basically your sole focus uh, at this point for, for a year plus <laughs> at where Adam and I have, have said it. Oh, here's knife throwing. It's not actual knife throwing. This is a, this I just posted this morning. Oh, uh, this okay. Is me showing off all those other tricks that I that I learned and that I don't actually do in the show anymore because no one cares about them. <laughs> is that? Oh, there is magic. Look at that. There's a little bit of magic. It's not good magic. Why is plate spinning in the Renaissance Fair? Is that an old timey thing? No, it's just a circus thing. Um, so my dad's show was called the Super Scientific Circus, still is called the Super Scientific Circus, where you teach science uh, through circus tricks. And so one of those was plate spinning because it teaches about centripetal and centrifugal force. And uh, I had a lot of days backstage where just just sat there spinning plates because it was the only thing to do. Oh, there you go. Indiana Jonesing with my dad. There you go. So okay. this is where... We tried all the things that Indiana Jones does in the movies <clears throat> with one of my dad's old whips made by the guy who made the whips for Indiana Jones, who's dead now. Um, and so, you know, that whip is worth more than I am. All of those whips are worth more than I am. Um, but he had these whips and, uh, and the new Indiana Jones movie was coming out this past summer, last summer. And I was like, well, let's, let's try and do some Indiana Jones tricks uh, with, with the whips. Like... Um, there's a flash that he does in the first oh, yeah, uh, Raiders that. movie. Um, that's actually harder than it, than it looks. Disarming an armed attacker. So I had him hold out a bat, pulled the bat out. It worked far better than I expected it to. <laughs> and then uh, trying to swing from a tree branch. So for this, we did not use one of those whips because I didn't want to break it. But we used an eight-foot whip, caught around it perfectly. And I don't, I don't have it here. Um, but it took me about three minutes to untie it from the tree i have it i have it in the, the bloopers reel that i think i i posted later because uh, it's really hard to actually untie a whip once you've tied you know you spent so much of your life trying to not get your whips tangled or like tie them into knots because they they will do that sometimes 
uh, and then trying to do it intentionally is, is really hard. That's cool. So there, there's Just, different ways to crack it? Yeah, so front crack, um, back crack, over the head crack, side crack. These are not the official terms. And then I say we will not be demonstrating the butt crack. Obviously not that kind of show. You can see that show somewhere else, but not with me. Um, but there are all sorts of different techniques that you can use for whip cracking. I think the, the the one that's most common, you know, that front crack is called either the circus crack or the cattleman's crack because it was how cattlemen would, would crack whips. Um, there's another one called the coachman's crack where you don't want it to crack out front because then you're going to be whipping, you know, the oxen or the horses that are pulling your carriage. Um, and so what you do is you kind of put, add this stutter into your hand so that it cracks right next to your right ear and makes you lose hearing for a few seconds. I don't like that crack. This is what I always wonder about people who do circus performance and any kind of thing where they have to have, like, how many copies of that outfit do you have? Are you just wearing the same one all have, the time? I have three different set. I have three vests. I have four shirts. I have three of those sashes the pants right now i have four but i'm having four brand new pair or no i have three uh because i sent one of them off to a woman who's making me four more pair of pants and then the socks i have probably like seven or eight pair of socks and then the shoes i have five or six pair of those yeah now wait does anybody just wear the same one every day like ooh. oh yeah oh yeah yeah and it, it gets gross. So for a while, I only had two, which was usually fine because I'm performing, you know, on weekends. But then you would have that stray, that rogue three-day weekend, let's say around like Memorial Day weekend or Labor Day weekend. And that Labor Day Monday, oh boy, would I smell bad. Because it's also, you know, it's late August, early September. It's still warm. It's, you know, even if you're in the Northeast in Boston, which is where I usually was, it's still, it's hot and it's humid and it's muggy. I mean, like, not like what you get in Arizona, but... Yes. Humidity, humidity helps or, or doesn't help, I should say. So how hard was this to do? Um, so these whips are so freaking heavy. And um, I have I have my shoulders are Swiss cheese, as I always like to say. They've got lots of lots of damage with them. So I start with a five pound chain whip, um, which is heavy, but it's crackable. I can do most of what I want. But this this other one is a 10 pound chain whip. And the whole time I'm swinging this being like, oh, God, just don't dislocate your shoulder trying to crack this thing because the, you can feel it pulling on you. The weight is there. I mean, you say, oh, it's only 10 pounds, but it's also eight feet long and just, you know, the centrifugal force. I always have to remember, is it centripetal or centrifugal? Uh, the centrifugal force is just pulling on your arm so much that I have to just like tuck everything in there to make sure nothing comes out. That's pretty much all the questions that I got. Is there anything that you think that we missed and what's kind of coming up next for you? Where can people find you? Uh, best way to find me is I'm, so I'm going on tour in, uh, just, a, just a few days, uh, busy 2024 ahead, uh, the full schedule. The easiest way to find it is at jackthewhipper.com or jacquesiwhipper.com or jacklepiars.com. No one knows how to spell any of my names. So I got all three domain names and they will all take you <laughs> to my website, which has my full schedule. Um, otherwise give me a follow TikTok, Instagram, uh, YouTube, Facebook. I'm on all the platforms and just about all the platforms get all the same content. I think Renaissance Fair is, it's a place where you can go and be yourself, no matter how weird yourself is.